This Torah class is brought to you by TorahAnytime.com. I want to take the opportunity to welcome you to this new series, Seven Habits of Highly Spiritual People. A new series that Amir Hashem we are launching for the remainder of Chodesh Shal. There's not that much even left to Elul anymore, but the last two weeks of Elul, and Amir Hashem to continue through the season of the Yamim No Ra'im, and Amir Hashem to continue on afterwards as well. This series is based on the highly acclaimed book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Stephen Covey. I want to begin by thanking, before I explain the series, I begin by thanking our sponsors for this year to thank the Wolf family, Ed and Faith Wolf and family for dedicating all of the Shi'urim this month. They are our Talmud Torah sponsors for the month of Elo, memory of Cyrus Wolf, Shalom Ben Tzvi Hirsch, to thank Joe and Galia Berry who dedicated all of the Shi'urim this week in honor of their 43rd wedding anniversary and Amir Hashem in celebration of their three and a half years of, after having made Aliyah. We thank our sponsors for their generosity and their dedication. So a word about this series. You know, I started, I've read Stephen Covey's book, books a couple of times and I've always found them incredibly helpful in trying to become a better person, trying to become a more effective person. And I thought that often when it comes to Chodesh Elul, our focus is often on tshuva, which is what it's supposed to be, right? The whole, the, the whole theme of these days is tshuva, is repentance, is change. And sometimes we don't necessarily know the ingredients necessary for change. In other words, I know what I have to change, but I don't always know how to change it. Or I don't always know what change is supposed to look like. Or for that matter, what are the steps of change? Like for example, the Rambam and Hilchus Tshuva brings down the various stages in Tshuva. A person has to stop sinning. Right? A person has to go ahead and admit their sin. A person has to have remorse for the past. So on and so forth. Because the Rambam understood, you can't just tell people to do Tshuva. Tshuva is a complex process. So I have to teach people, says the Rambam, the stages, the different parts of Tshuva. So when it comes to personalistic change, so many of us, I know, I, I shouldn't speak with someone, I know I have to change. But I, then I wonder to myself, like, why is it? I know that I have to change. I know that I have to change and improve for many years. I even know what it is that I have to change. So why haven't I changed it? Why haven't I made the necessary tikkunim, the necessary changes or adaptations in my life? So sometimes it's because I'm just lazy and I just haven't done it. But other times it's also because I know what I have to do, but again, I don't know necessarily how to do it. And I found that this book of Seven Habits of Highly Effective People is an incredible framework for change. And I think many of Stephen Covey's idea, first of all, stem from a religious mindset. And I think we're going to use this series, Amir Hashem, to develop the seven habits, but to also expound on them through the lens of Torah, through the lens of Chazal, through the lens of Chasidus, of Hashkafa, to really create seven habits or seven principles that hopefully will form the framework which will allow us to change. So by way of introduction, my introduction, so, so Kavi highlights something quite fascinating. He has a quote, I want to quote to you, he says, Each of us tends to think we see things as they are, that we are objective. But this is not the case. We see the world not as it is, but as we are, or as we are conditioned to see it. One more time. We see the world not as it is, but as we are. And this is incredibly important. We've spoken about this over the years in many different Shalom Bayis classes, in Chinuch classes. But this to me is, is, is the beginning of, of every avoda, every, every personalistic service of change. To recognize that I see the world through my lens. It is not an objective lens. It's my subjective lens that is a composite of so many different things. It's a composite of my history. It's a composite of my upbringing, composite of my family. It's a composite of today, right? We all know you have a bad day. The world looks one way. You have a great day. The world looks a different way. And this is incredibly important because this leads us to the next important step, which is the willingness to undergo a paradigm shift. We all create our paradigms in life. A paradigm represents the constructs through which you see something, through which you see the world, through which you see yourself. And those constructs, those paradigms, are developed, often, and, developed and reinforced over the course of many, many years. 
And many of us get stuck in our paradigms, get stuck in our constructs, and we can't see anything else. A paradigm shift is when a person is willing to take a step back, take a step back and say, I see the world not as it is, but rather I see the world as I am. And therefore, maybe I'm not seeing the world. Maybe I'm not seeing life. Maybe I'm not seeing myself really as it needs to be seen. Covey tells an incredible story about a paradigm shift. I'm actually going to quote to you. He says, I remember a mini paradigm shift I experienced on Sunday, on a, one Sunday morning on a subway in New York. I've actually quoted this story before, but to me, it's such a, such a musser. People were sitting quietly, some reading newspapers, some lost in thoughts, some resting with their eyes closed. It was a calm, peaceful scene. Then suddenly a man and his children entered the subway car. The children were so loud and rambunctious that instantly the whole climate changed. The man sat down next to me and closed his eyes, apparently oblivious to the situation. The children were yelling back and forth, throwing things, even grabbing people's papers. It was very disturbing, and yet the man sitting next to me did nothing. It was difficult not to feel irritated. I could not believe that he could be so insensitive as to let his children run wild like that and do nothing about it, taking no responsibility at all. It was easy to see that everyone else in the subway felt irritated too. Suddenly, so finally, with what I felt was unusual patience and restraint, I turned to him and said, Sir, your children are really disturbing a lot of people. I wonder if you couldn't control them a little more. The man lifted his gaze as if to come to a consciousness of the situation for the first time and said softly, Oh, you're right. I guess I should do something about it. We just came from the hospital where their mother died about an hour ago. I don't know what to think, and I guess they don't know how to handle it either. And so Covey explains this story, and he says, I experienced this incredible paradigm shift here, Right? My understanding of the circumstance is what? These are a bunch of bratty kids, rude kids, and an absent parent, a parent who is pretty much shirking his responsibilities. Why aren't you disciplining your kid? Why aren't you controlling your kid? You're just letting them do whatever they want. And then in that moment, so he saw, he saw the world, he thought he understood everything. And in that moment, when the man explains to him what exactly had happened, his entire understanding of the situation shifts. And this is incredibly important because the willingness to undergo a paradigm shift is in and of itself a prerequisite for personalistic change. You see, if a person says, I know, I know everything. I know everything about me. I know everything about life. I know how everything is supposed to be and everything is great. Okay? So Baruch Hashem, if you could be a person, I don't know if it's Baruch Hashem could be a person like that, but sad to be a person like that. But Lamaisa, a person like that, there's not really much room to do anything with. There's not really much room to change anything. They're, okay, it, 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 is, it is what it is. It is what it is. But if a person is willing to take a step back and say, you know what, I know I see the world in a certain way. I know I see myself in a certain way. But maybe I'm not right. Maybe I'm not right. So let me take a step back and be willing to go ahead and rethink things. Let me be willing to go ahead and relook at things. You know, just as an aside, is this not part of the greatest challenge our current society is facing. I find that today it is virtually impossible to have an open-minded discussion regarding any matter of political significance with pretty much anyone. We're all set in our ways, and I'm sure I'm like that as well. We're all set in our ways. Just for the record, I don't engage in too much political discourse because it's not good, it's not healthy, certainly not for a Rav and the Shul. But it's interesting Everybody is so convinced they have the MS. Everybody is so convinced. And they're unwilling to hear or unwilling to listen. And worse, and worse, vilify the other. If you don't believe like I do, you're a racist. You're intolerant. You're a supremacist. You're this. It's incredible. There's absolutely no room for a person to say, I have my strongly held opinion. You have your strongly held opinion. I disagree with you vehemently, but... But maybe you're right. Let, let, me, let me take a step back and try to see it from your perspective. But back to us, back to Elul, back to Yamim No Ryan. Our goal is to change. And when I say change, probably the better word is to advance, progress, evolve. 
I want to become better because change sometimes is scary. When people hear change, they think I have to become someone different. I don't have to become someone different. I just want to become someone better. I don't have to be different. I just want to be better. Now, the truth is we realize that in order to become better, I often have to become different as well. The prerequisite to that is a willingness to undergo a paradigm shift. A willingness to say, I've seen myself. We're focusing now on the personalistic. I've seen myself and I've seen my life in a certain way. And I've lived in my life in a certain construct. Is that personalistic construct correct? A lot of times we justify bad behaviors that we engage in. Because you say, this, this is the framework I live in, so it's become part of my lifestyle. Okay, just because you do something often doesn't make it permitted. Or just because you've done something for a prolonged period of time doesn't mean that it's okay. So the paradigm shift allows us to take a step back and to say, I want to reimagine myself. I want to reimagine myself. I don't want to see. I don't want to keep perpetuating the same Shmuel silver. I'd like to have a vision of how I could be better, how I could be holier, how I could be just a better individual. So, assuming that if you're listening to this year, you're willing to undergo the paradigm shift. So, if that's the case, that's where these habits, these seven habits come in incredible, really, really give us an incredible sense of clock, an incredible sense of structure, how to advance change. If I'm willing to undergo the paradigm shift, the seven habits will give me the tools in order to be able to effectively create that personalistic change. So for today's, for today's shear, we'll focus a little bit, I don't know that we'll get through all of it, but on habit number one. To so habit number one, Kavi calls, be proactive. So to give a bit of, of background to this. There is a school of psychological thought called determinism. And in determinism, it's the view that all events are determined by previously existing causes. In the world of determinism, there are essentially three different groupings. There's genetic determinism, which says everything everything you are, whoever you are, is your DNA. You are hardwired to be a certain way. Right? Genetic determinism. So again, the same way that I can't control what color my hair is, or if you have hair, right? Every, every aspect of me is determined based on my genetics. There's psychic determinism, which ultimately says that your parents, your home life, your childhood experiences make you who you are, very Freudian in nature. Everything is about my upbringing. Everything is about my childhood. If you have a good childhood, that's a great determinant for your future. If you had a scarred childhood, a traumatic childhood, then chances are you're just going to be damaged goods. And then there's environmental determinism. So environmental determinism says everything in your environment shapes who you are. Now, just so you understand how far this goes, what this says is if you have a bad day at work, you have a bad day at work, you have a mean boss, you don't have good friends, you're in a bad marriage, whatever, your kids are disrespectful, I'm giving all negative examples, but the positive is also true. All of those things in your environment impact who you are. Of course, it's true in the positive as well. All of the positive influences in your life will positively impact who you are. So this is the essence of determinism, that all events are determined by previously existing causes, either my DNA, either my family, or my environment. To kind of summarize all of these approaches, you you could kind of put them on a piece of paper in a very simple way. There's stimulus and response. Stimulus and response. Something happens, and whatever happens, that causes an automatic response. So again, if you're a chassid of genetic determinism, so there's a stimulus, whatever that stimulus is, something happens, my response is genetically pre-programmed. Psychic determinism, there's a stimulus, something happens, I'm going to respond a certain way based on how I was raised, based on the parents that I have. Environmental determinism, there is a stimulus, something happens, and I'm going to respond. But essentially, in the world of determinism, so the stimulus comes from wherever it comes from, wherever it is, but the response is somewhat scripted. right? In other words, the response is always going to follow the same model. Depending on which school of thought of determinism you go with, the response is always going to be the same. So I'll show you something amazing, and Kavi quotes this as well. So Viktor Frankl, Viktor Frankl, who I'm sure many of you, if not all of you have heard of, survivor of the Holocaust, was a determinist. He was a Beshita determinist raised in the tradition of Freudian psychology. So meaning, again, in his worldview, the impact of our parents, the impact of our upbringing, 
Mamish fundamentally determines who you are. So essentially, whatever happens to you as a child shapes your life in its entirety. Frankel, who was a survivor of Auschwitz, fundamentally changed his thinking in the aftermath of the war. Based on what he was able to observe in the camps, based on his own experiences, and based on what he was able to see from others, he fundamentally changed his approach. He left the world of determinism. I want to quote you from his book, Man's Search for Meaning. So Frankel writes in his book, Man's Search for Meaning, Everything can be taken from man, but one thing. The last of the human freedoms to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances, to choose one's own way. One more quote. We who lived in the con- in concentration camps can remember the men who walked through the huts comforting others, sorry, comforting others, giving away their last piece of bread. They may have been few in number, but they offer sufficient proof that everything can be taken from man but one thing, the last of the human freedoms, to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances, to choose one's own way. So Covey quotes this idea from Viktor Frankl and he adds in one additional line. Between stimulus and response, man has the ability to choose. So this to me is such an incredible yisod. If you're a chassid of determinism, so determinism says that there is a stimulus, something happens, and then there is a scripted response. Because remember again, who you are and what you are is fundamentally dictated by previously existing causes. Whether it's the day that you had today, if you have a good boss, if you had good parents, if you have good DNA, whatever it is. So determinism says what, there's a stimulus and then there's a scripted response. What Frankl was highlighting was this incredible idea that no, it need not go stimulus right into response. There's a space there. There's a space. And that space ultimately again is where you insert choice. It's where you insert choice. So there's a stimulus, something happens. But I don't subscribe to determinism. I don't subscribe that I already have a scripted response. Right after that stimulus, I have the ability to choose. To choose. I could choose, what what do I have to, what do I I get to choose? So remember, a lot of times, you don't get to choose the circumstances, right? The stimulus is there. The stimulus often is separate and distinct from me. Is something occurring to me or come, something occurring for me or with me? So often I can't choose the stimulus. But the question is, how do I respond? Right? How do I, how, how do I choose to respond in that moment? In that moment. And then, ultimately, again, it goes from stimuli, to, it goes from stimulus to response. So in other words, my response need not be scripted. I could choose the type of response I have to any circumstance. And this may sound very simple and elementary, but how many of us live thinking that we don't have choices? Something happens and we act so helpless. Something happens, someone does something, and we feel victimized. Now it's true, a lot of times you can't control what other people do for you, to you, how other people act. You always choose your response. You know, Covey makes an amazing observation. He says the word responsibility is made up of two words. Responsibility. I have the ability to choose my response. What, what is true responsibility? True responsibility is when you don't fall prey to the determinism hashkafa. When you don't assume that you are just a series of pre-programmed responses, that they're stimuli. You know where you hear this all the time? Sometimes when a person has a bad temper. So a person has a bad temper, they fly off the handle. So sometimes what people actually say, and it's crazy, and sometimes I've said this as well, and you think about it afterwards, it's crazy. I, I just have a bad temper. What, what, is, what does that mean? You just have a bad, you just have a bad temper? So a bad temper, that, that, that's like saying, that's like saying, well, you know what, I have to lose a couple of times, I'm just over it. Well, no, no, if, if I wouldn't have had three pieces of chocolate cake, things would have been different. What do you mean, just, you just have a bad temper? So remember, again, just saying, I just have a bad temper, then you're a chassid of determinism. Then what you're saying is, at the end of the day, I don't control me. I don't control me. I'm hardwired in a certain way. It was my father. He didn't love me enough. It was my mother. It was this. It was that. So I'm not responsible for how I respond. This is just my scripted response. And what Frankl's teaching us, 
And ultimately, again, what Kavi is teaching us is that no, I'm a responsible person. And what's responsibility? Responsibility. I have the ability to control my response. I don't go right into the response from the stimulus, from the stimuli, but rather something happens, I pause, and I have to decide how do I want to, how do I want to react to this? How do I want to respond? I think we'd all agree that some of the things that we regret most in life, that we regret most in life, are the things where we respond hastily and we didn't take a moment to think. Sometimes it's something I said, and I said it in the heat of the moment, and I just should not have said it. Now I try to comfort myself by saying, it kind of just came out. <laughs> it just came out. No, no, no. Nothing just comes out. Nothing just comes out. The number of neurons and everything else you need in order to articulate a word of speech is dramatic. Nothing it just comes out. But what I did is I allowed myself to be a deterministic person. I allowed my response just to be governed by the stimulus as opposed to going ahead and being a person of responsibility, of being a person who recognizes that although I can't control the stimuli, I don't have to trigger an immediate response, I have the ability to choose. I have the ability to choose. Now, once a person accepts this premise that he or she has the ability to choose, then this really creates the difference between being a proactive and a reactive person. Reactive people, reactive people just respond. They just respond. Because again, I'm driven by the stimuli. Whatever, whatever happens, I just respond to whatever it is that happens. Proactive people realize, again, I might not be able to control the stimuli, but I absolutely control what I want to do in this circumstance. I control how I'm going to talk, and I control how I'm going to conduct myself, and I control how I'm going to spend my time. I can't control so many other things, but I absolutely have the ability to control my response. And when I say response, I don't just mean verbally. I mean, I have the ability to control my response in life to whatever it is that occurs. I have that koach. The distinction between being a proactive and reactive person, or there are some people who, you know, when, when a person faces a problem, so there are sometimes a person will tell you, yes, there's a problem, and I'll tell you why. Because Ruvain's not doing his thing, and Shemin's not behaving, and this one didn't do this, and ah, it's too hot, and it's too humid, and, it's this, and there's a million. And by the way, all of those things may be correct. All of those things may be correct. It could be that the person is saying, 100% MS, everything is correct. But what you're allowing yourself is to become a reactive person. The world is acting upon you. So you're enslaved to all of these other things. So because no one else is doing what you think they're supposed to be doing, therefore you're powerless and paralyzed. A react, excuse me, a proactive person says, okay, it's true, Ruben's not doing this, and Shimon's not doing this, and it is way too humid, and everything else. But the mindset, I have to choose how I want to act in this circumstance. I have to choose what I should do. I have to choose my response. I have to be, I have to exercise responsibility, response ability. I have the ability to choose how to respond to this particular situation. You know, Kavi tells an incredible story. I want to quote it to you from here because I, I thought it was really great. He tells the story that he was once giving a seminar and he was talking about this concept of proactivity. So listen to the story. So the man comes up to me and he says, Stephen, I like what you're saying, but every situation is so different. Look at my marriage. I'm really worried. My wife and I just don't have the same feelings for each other we used to have. I guess I just don't love her anymore, and she doesn't love me. What can I do? The feeling isn't there anymore, I asked. Kavi speaking. That's right, he reaffirmed, and we have three children we're really concerned about. What do you suggest? Love her, I replied. I told you, the feeling just isn't there anymore. Love her. You don't understand. The feeling of love just isn't there. Then love her. And if the feeling isn't there, that's a good reason to love her. But how do you love when you don't love? My friend, love, love is a verb. Love the feeling is a fruit of love the verb. So love her, serve her, sacrifice, listen to her, empathize, appreciate, affirm her, are you willing to do that? So what an incredible insight. If you look at the word love, 
So what is love? So we often assume love is a feeling. Love is a feeling. But the problem is, if love is a feeling, then I'm being reactive. So if I love you, if I love you, I'm waiting for something to engender that feeling. That's called being a reactive individual. As opposed to if you look at love as a verb. Love is something I do. It's something I do. If I love you, I take care of you. I serve you. I provide for you. I do for you. And then when you do, when you do, the feeling comes out after that. You know, Rashi HaKadosh says the same exact idea. Rashi says, Love Hashem with all of your heart. Right? Love Hashem. Love Hashem. And again, the obvious question we have on that is God can mandate a variety of things. HaKadosh Baruch Hu could tell me to honor Him. HaKadosh Baruch Hu could tell me to keep Shabbos, to eat kosher, a whole bunch of things. But how can you command someone to love? Right? So what does Rashi say? So remember, right, you hear the question, how can HaKadosh Baruch Hu tell me to love Him? Tell me to serve Him, tell me to fear, tell me to reveal, love Him? And Rashi says something amazing. Rashi says, Asay Dvarov Me'ahava. It means at the end of the day, serve HaKadosh Baruch Hu as if you love Him. Serve Him as if you love Him. What is Rashi saying? See, Kavi thinks it's his Chiddush. It's not his Chiddush. Rashi already says it. Rashi says, you think love is an emotion. You think V'yahavtas Hashem Elokecha is an emotional obligation. No, it's a verb. It's a verb. V'yahavtas Hashem Elokecha means serve HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Serve Him. Because when you love someone, you want to take care of them. When you love someone, you want to be there for them. When you love someone, you want to give to them. V'yahavtas Hashem Elokecha is not God legislating my emotional state of being because you can't legislate emotions. Love is not a feeling in the eyes of God. But rather, again, love is a verb. Love your fellow as you love yourself. Let's be honest. We're amongst friends. Everybody questions that mitzvah. Because I know some people, not anyone watching this year, of course, but I know some people who are just not lovable. They're just really not lovable. In fact, I do anything and everything just to avoid them. I'd rather have nothing to do with them at all. But I have to love everyone. Same idea, same idea. What does Hillel say in the Gemara? Madasani alecha lechavercha lo savid. What you don't want done unto you, don't do to someone else. Love is not a feeling in the eyes of the Torah, in the eyes of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Love is a verb. Love is something you do. And herein lies the difference between being a proactive or a reactive individual. Reactive people understand love as an emotion. As I hear it all the time. I'm just not in love anymore. Okay. You're just not in love anymore. Now what? Almost as if, almost as if a person is helpless. Helpless. I've fallen out of love. And again, whether it's fall, I've fallen out of love with my spouse or I've fallen out of love with God, I've fallen out of love. Okay. And, and, and what, and what are you doing? You see, when you speak about love as an emotion, then you are the helpless victim. You fall, something has occurred that has made you fall out of love. And apparently there's nothing that's within your power to make you fall back into love. But if you look at love as a verb, which is what reactive, excuse me, which is what proactive people do. Proactive people, responsibility people, choice people say, okay, being in love is a choice. Being in love is a choice. It, it's a choice. And I know this might fly in the convention of some relationship wisdom, but being in love in a very large measure is a choice. The feeling doesn't come by itself. The feeling comes from action. The feeling comes from avoda. The feeling comes from proactivity. That is true in our marriages, and it's true in our relationship with Hashem. How many people walk around uninspired? How many of us walk around uninspired? Davening does nothing for me. Mitzvahs does nothing for me. And you know, so people, we love to say, it's the yeshiva system. It's the Beis Yaakov system. It's the school system. It's my parents were authoritarians or my teachers were this. And by the way, all that might be true. The schools, everything could always be better. I could be a better parent. We, we could all be better in every single way. But Lamais, I have one question. What are you doing? What are you doing? So you've fallen out of love with God. Fantastic. Fantastic. But again, so if, if, if I'm coming home and, uh, and then the rest of Shabbos is in my shorts and a t-shirt, I mean, how about that should be the worst thing to do? But if, you know, if, if, if that's it, if that's it, if, if, if I'm lazy, if I'm spiritually lazy and just spiritually lackadaisical, 
So what do you expect? What do you expect? You expect to fall in love? You expect that somehow magically you're going to see the Rebbe Shalom, he's going to see you, the birds are going to be chirping, there's soft music playing in the background, you're going to run towards each other and fall into each other's arms? You know, they don't even make movies like that anymore, let alone real life. Love is a verb. Proactive people realize that if you want love in your life, you want love in your marriage, work hard. Work hard. Don't, and by the way, don't expect your spouse to do something... Don't, don't put it on anyone else because the moment you put it on someone else is the moment that you are falling prey to determinism, is the moment that ultimately, again, you assume there's just stimulus, stimuli, and response. It's someone else who's in charge. Take the reins back of your life. Be a proactive individual. Be responsible. Responsibility. You want love in your life. Make it happen. Make it happen. Be the best husband or the best wife you possibly could be. You want HaKadosh Baruch Hu in your life? You want a meaningful relationship with Hashem? Love Him, but not the emotion. The verb. The verb. Serve Him. Davin. Learn. Give tzedakah. Do chesed. Push yourself harder and harder. And when you keep working, when you keep exhibiting or, or living love as a verb, then ultimately the emotion will come. Along these same lines, Kavi goes on to explain that a person also has to make a distinction between the various categories of life events. So now that we've established that I do not want to be a chassid of determinism, that I'd rather be a chassid, at least hashkafically, of Viktor Frankl, recognizing that between stimulus and response, there is a space. And in that space is choice. And those who choose choice become proactive individuals. Those who choose choice live, lo- live life with love as a verb, not love as a feeling. Those who choose choice, choose to take the reins of their life and not be directed. They choose to act and not be acted upon. But in order to fully exercise this choice, a person has to identify the different categories of life events. And it's here that Covey kind of breaks up things into three different categories. What he calls it direct, indirect, or no control. So there are things over which I have direct control. So those are the things that I could change by working on myself. We all run into this. There are things that are not really working so well in my life, but I know that I could change it. I have direct control over those circumstances. Indirect control means I don't really hold the reins on this. Others might hold the reins, but I have the ability to influence others. I have the ability to influence the circumstances. The last category are things over which I have no control. And things over which I have no control, this, you see, the first two are kind of obvious. Direct control, if I control it, fix it. Indirect control, that, that really requires me to have good interpersonal skills, be able to get along with people, be able to collaborate. But what's interesting is the no control category, because you would say to yourself, okay, well, I have no control, I have no control. Yet, how much time do we spend focusing on the things over which we have no control? How much time do we spend literally, again, focusing and really even like lamenting, perseverating on those things over which I have no control? Over which I have no control. It's kind of like talking about the weather. You know, sometimes people speak about the weather in small talk. You ever have a conversation about the weather with people, mama, should get upset. Like, it's so humid. And like, they're, they're visibly angry over the humidity. I, I, I don't like humidity either. But at the end of the day, not my department. I, I, I can't handle I have nothing to do with it. So you have, you, you, you have no control over the weather. So are you, you going to allow it to weigh on you? Or ultimately, again, are you going to say, you know what? I have to... Life, every person has a finite amount of koach. A finite amount of energy and ability. And in life, you have to choose where you want to put your kohos. And sometimes the greatest mistake we make is that we divert way too much energy to the no control category. You see, you have to be careful because here, I want to be a proactive person. I want to be a responsibility person. I don't want to be a chassid of determinism. So now that I know that I'm going to be proactive, I have choice. You have to use your choice in the right ways. So use your choice in the areas of direct control, indirect control, but in the areas of no control, Let it go. 
let it go. It would be nice to say don't think about it. Most of us aren't on level to think about it. But at least don't let it eat up resources. Don't let it eat up time. Don't let it eat up your soul. Sometimes on the things over which we have no control, we just have to be ready to let go. I want to conclude with what I think is an incredible example of, of this entire essence, of everything we've spoken about. And that's the story of Yosef Atzadik. Because I think in the story of Yosef, Yosef personifies all of these ideas. And the amazing part is, Yosef somehow understood this intuitively or, or innately. He certainly was never actively taught it. or he, he learned many things from his father, life lessons from his father. But we know the story of Yosef. You know, and this is important because Yosef has a very important Rosh Hashanah tie-in. The Gemara Mesechus Rosh Hashanah Daft Yunob in Beis 10b says as follows, Be Rosh Hashanah, Yotze Yosef mi Beis Asurin. On Rosh Hashanah, Yosef left jail. Left jail on Rosh Hashanah. And it always struck me, you know, that Gemara is part of a whole string of Gemaras, where it says, on Rosh Hashanah, Sara, Rivka, Rachel, Chana, were all remembered for children on, on Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah, the world was created. So I understand the power of a woman being remembered for childbirth, life, creation of the world, life, that Yosef was released from jail on Rosh Hashanah. It's interesting, but what's, 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 what's the pshat? Like, what's the deeper meaning? So perhaps what the Chazal were trying to express to us was the following. Let's take a look at the story of Yosef in jail. What happens when Yosef goes to jail? I remember again, the wife of Potiphar tries to seduce Yosef. Yosef goes in and resists her temptations. As a result, she maligns him. And therefore, he's thrown into prison. So the Pasuk says, what happens when Yosef was in prison? The Pasuk says, this is in Bereshus, Perek Lamites, Pasuk of Beis, chapter 39, verse 22. This is amazing. Yosef is given, he's in charge. He's in charge. The warden puts Yosef in charge of all of the prisoners. Asher Abes HaZohar, Vechol Asher Osim Sham Hu Haya Ose. Yosef was in charge of everything. Now my friends, I'll ask you a simple question. Can you imagine Yosef's mental state? The boy, he was 17 years old, stripped of his clothing and his dignity by his brothers, thrown into a pit, sold like, a, like less than an animal. Finally comes to Mitzrayim, Finds a finds a, a nice householder works for Potiphar goes up the ranks in Potiphar's own Potiphar goes in and trusts him with everything everything. This woman Potiphar's wife tries to make advances on him. It takes all his inner strength to go ahead and say no and say no. Chazal speak about Yosef's internal struggle. To, should he succumb to the desire not to go? He, but he's he's able to muster up the inner strength and then what happens? He's thrown into jail. He's thrown into jail a second time. Right? Remember again, the first time Yosef was put in jail was really when his brothers threw him into a pit. It's the same Lushan even. It's always the pit. Right? The base Asar, the pit is, oh, excuse me, the jail is always a pit. So I don't know, I often think if I was Yosef and I was thrown into the pit, you know, I would have said, Rolling Shalom, I'm done. I'm done. Crawl into a wall, sit into the corner. I, I'm, I'm, I'm just done. I'm just done. How much could one person possibly handle? How much could one person possibly take? And yet, what does Yosef do? Yosef rolls up his sleeves in the jail and he says, how can I be productive? What can I do? What can I do? There is the stimuli of everything that happened. Potiphar, Potiphar's wife, my brothers, everything else. And then there is ultimately, again, the response. And the response should be, I'm angry, I'm jaded, I'm forsaken, I'm cynical. But instead, Yosef realizes that there is a space between stimulus and response. And in that space is choice. And it is there, here, here, there, that Yosef chooses to exercise that choice. I'm not going to curl up into a ball and just cry myself into oblivion in this jail, even though I have every right to do so. I choose to make something of myself. I choose to do something with these circumstances as difficult as they may be. I choose, I choose to do something with the circumstances that the Rebbe Shalom has given me. I choose not to be reactive. I choose to be proactive. And it gets even more amazing. Because if you skip down a little bit in those psukim, when Yosef then comes out of jail, right, he interprets Paro's dreams, he becomes the viceroy, and then, of course, the dramatic meeting between the brothers. So before Yosef reveals his identity, so he's stringing them along in this whole, in this whole charade, then he finally reveals his identity to them. And what does he say? 
What does he say? Listen to these Pesukim. This is in Parak Mem Hebreishes, chapter 45, verse, verse 5 and on. My brothers, now, don't be upset that you sold me to Egypt. Hashem sent me in order to provide food for all of you. He goes on, Hashem sent me ahead to ensure that the family of Yaakov Avinu would survive and that ultimately you'd be able to go ahead, come and resettle in Egypt and ride out the famine. Vi'ata, listen to these words. And now my brothers, it is not you. You didn't send me. God sent me here. God made me a second in command to Pharaoh. This Pesach always bothered me. How does Yosef have the right to say to his brothers, you didn't send? It wasn't you. It wasn't you who sent me to Egypt. It was God. Really? Really? It wasn't you? By the way, fast forward a little bit. And, you know, we're going to read about it on Yom Kippur, on Tisha B'Av, the Asaru Gemachos, the ten martyrs. And our tradition tells us that why were the ten martyrs, the ten great sages, why were they murdered in such a brutal and horrific fashion? It was Kalal Yisrael's punishment for the sale of Yosef. Kalal Yisrael's punishment for the sale of Yosef. So don't tell me, don't tell me that bro- you said Yosef, is- it's okay guys, don't, don't, no, no sweat, you know what? Mistakes happen. Stuff happens between siblings. Yeah, we sell each other. We slaughter goats, pretend that we're dead. It happens. Let's just call it even. All is good. What is Yosef saying? Those words, Lo atem shalachtem osihena. You didn't send me. What do you mean, Yosef? These are the brothers who stripped you of your clothing and your dignity. These are the brothers who sold you, threw you into a pit, who are ready to kill you, who are ready to kill you had Yehuda not intervened and Yehuda convinced them then to go out and sell you. Or the brothers decided then to sell him. So what do you mean you didn't send me? What do you mean? You're, what, they're not responsible? So what's happening over here, dear friends, is something amazing. Yosef HaTzadik is making a choice as to how to view his circumstances. He's making a choice. He's not rewriting history. He says, I realize I have a choice here. The choice is, I can look at these circumstances. My brothers sold me into servitude. They sold me like a piece of property and they mistreated me so horribly. I could say that. I could say that. And then if that's my narrative, then at the end of the day, I'll be filled with resentment, anger, and animosity towards you to my dying breath. Or, I can choose to recognize that this is part of a divine plan. Everything is part of a divine plan. The Ribbon Hashem orchestrates and organizes everything. So this is what HaKadosh Baruch Hu did. So Yosef is not absolving his brothers. Yosef is giving his brothers a window into his cognitive process. I have to make a choice now about how I view the last 22 years. Do I view them as perpetually being wronged by people close to me? I'm wronged by my brothers. I was wronged by Potiphar. I was wronged by Potiphar's wife. Is that how I view my life? And even before that, you know, the brothers had a very difficult relationship with Yosef even before they sold him. Now again, maybe Yosef contributed to that, but is that how I view my life? I'm one, one big victimhood narrative? No, I'm not a victim. Instead, what I am is an important cog in the wheel. It's true I was acted upon, but I also acted. I acted Yosef HaTzadik chooses, makes a choice to be proactive in life. And that proactivity expresses itself by his choice of life narrative. I will not choose the narrative of victimhood. Instead, I will choose the narrative of being HaKadosh Baruch Hu's right-hand man in the actualization of a dramatic and magnificent divine plan. I am not a victim. I'm not a victim. I am a major key, I'm a major part, I'm a major cog in the wheel of a magnificent divine operation. Yosef HaTzadik is the paradigmatic example of what it means to be a proactive person who chooses to insert choice in between stimulus and response. You see, from Yosef's world, the stimulus was the oppression of his brothers. That was the stimulus the natural response would have been aggression, animosity, anger, revenge. But he inserts choice, and it's a little bit different. Yosef serves as an incredible example. So if we bring this all together, what we come out with in habit number one of being proactive is an incredible paradigm shift in how we live our lives. So many times we're faced with circumstances and we feel powerless in the face of them. 
because since someone else or something else caused the circumstances, I assume that I don't have the power to shape them. But that's not true. That's determinism. Determinism says everything is scripted, whether it's your DNA, whether it's your environment, whether it's your parents. We believe ultimately, again, like Frankel said, that in between stimulus and response is that power of choice. We believe that we have the ability to be proactive people. I need not be reactive. I could be the kind of person who believes in love as the verb, not just simply love as the feeling. I believe in love as the feeling as well, but that feeling is generated by the verb, not vice versa. I believe at the end of the day that I have to use my efforts and exert my control over the things over which I have direct and indirect control and stop wasting my time over the things that I have no control over. And as we're in Chodesh Elul and we begin to think about ourselves, we begin to think about our lives, we have to ask ourselves, are we proactive or reactive individuals? Have we fallen prey to the hashkaf of determinism? Or do we have the power to be a Yosef? We often, we often don't choose the stimulus, but we always have the ability to choose the response. May we be Zochem Yaretz Hashem to find that koach of Yosef. May we Zochem Yaretz Hashem to begin our journey by allowing ourselves to undergo that paradigm shift and Amir Tzashem Yerizocha to take the reins of proactivity and start driving the direction of our life, the direction of our personalistic narrative. Wishing everyone a wonderful evening. You've just experienced another Torah class brought to you by TorahAnytime.com.